We begin by praising Allah, we praise Him, we seek His help and we ask for His forgiveness. And we take refuge with Allah from the evil of ourselves and from the evil consequence of our evil actions. Whomsoever Allah guides, no one can misguide, and whomsoever Allah leaves to go astray, no one can guide. I testify that Allah alone is worthy of worship and that Muhammad, may Allah's peace and blessings be upon him, is the servant of Allah and his final messenger. My dear brothers and sisters, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala shower his mercy upon you, may Allah guide you upon the path of goodness, and may Allah keep you away from the sins. We were talking last time about as salah establishing as salah and that abandoning the salah is one of the major sins. Indeed, the companions of the Prophet did not used to consider the abandoning of any action as disbelief except the abandoning of as salah Indeed, Ali ibn Talib, it's reported that he said that the person who does not pray is a disbeliever and that is very similar to what the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said and we mentioned various narrations in that regard. We wanted to discuss a few more issues and topics under this very important topic of as salah considering it is so important. Indeed, the scholars discussed this issue of the person who abandons the prayer and most of the scholars agreed that there is actually a punishment for the person who abandons the prayer and most of them agreed that the person who purposefully abandons prayer could be punished by the Islamic authorities, by the state. It's not something an individual can do, but the state has the authority to actually put someone to death who persistently refuses to pray. And they base that upon the Prophet wasallam saying that when a child reaches the age of seven, you should encourage them to pray. And if they are not praying by the age of ten, then you should beat them. So they said, well, if you beat a child who is the age of ten who is not praying, then how about an adult? What is left? If you beat a child, then how about an adult? And they said, well, the only thing that is more severe than that is death. And they also based it upon other things that we have already mentioned about the one who abandons prayer is like a disbeliever. Now there's another very important issue that I want to discuss with you about the prayer brothers and sisters and that is about praying but not praying properly and we've already talked about the people who are neglectful of their prayers, they leave them out of the proper times but there is another type of neglect concerning as salah and that is when people pray very quickly, they peck on the ground like you find the chicken is pecking and they're praying so fast and the Prophet wasallam, in fact, when he saw a person who was not praying and not standing and bowing and taking their time, he told this person to go back three times, go back and pray again and go back and pray again, for you did not pray. Until this man said, I don't know any other way to pray, Messenger of Allah. How should I pray? And the Prophet wasallam, then explained to him how he should pray and that how in each movement, in each position, the bowing, the prostration, the sitting, he should pause for the length of time to allow all his joints and his bones to come to rest. So the Prophet ﷺ, in several different narrations, he mentioned about those people who peck on the ground, he said they are not from us. And remember we already mentioned that is a criterion of a major sin. So actually pecking the ground like a chicken and praying in that sort of way very quickly, that is actually a major sin. Because the Prophet ﷺ described those people, they're not from our ummah, they're not from amongst us. In another narration, the Prophet ﷺ, he saw a man who did not straighten his back. Now when you go into ruku', you are supposed to have your back at 90 degrees. In fact, they used to say that if they'd put a glass or a cup of water on the back of the Prophet ﷺ, when he was making ruku, it wouldn't have spilt. So that's the angle one is supposed to be at. And the Prophet ﷺ saw someone not doing that. He said if he died like that, he would have died outside the religion of Islam or on a religion other than the religion of Islam. 
And this is a type of very severe threat, the Prophet wasallam. This is just for not bowing properly. So this also shows the importance of completing and perfecting the prayer in the proper manner. So not only praying on time, but also praying in the right manner, in the right way, being attentive to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Because my brothers and sisters, what is the prayer for? What is the purpose of the prayer? It is of course to remind you of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, to make you think deeply about your Lord, to thank Him, to praise Him, to remember the day that you will stand in front of Him subhanahu wa ta'ala and He will ask you about all the things that you have done and the things that you have not done. So that is why we should really take care and attention to make the prayer properly in its time with attentiveness, thinking about our Lord Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, understanding what we are saying, because that is also a prerequisite and a condition for the correctness of the prayer is to understand the words that you are saying. I wonder how many people even understand the tashahud. How many people even understand what it means at tahiyyatu lillahi wa salawaitu wa tayyibatu? Many people have no idea what that means. They say it and they don't understand the meaning, but it is compulsory. It's obligatory to know the meaning of what you say in your prayer. The minimum amount of Arabic you all need to know is what you say in your prayer. How then can you have khushu in your prayer? How then can you have attentiveness in your prayer? How then can you be humble before Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and you don't even understand what you are saying? So, Ubaba bin Samit, he said that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, if anyone has made ablution in an excellent manner, if anyone who has made ablution in an excellent manner and then stood up for prayer and has completed bowing and prostrating and has recited in it, the prayer says to him, may Allah preserve you as you have preserved me. So that's what we want. We want our prayer to be like that. So that when we have completed our prayer, the prayer will say, may Allah preserve you as you have preserved me. And inshallah, we will be preserved. And then it goes up, the prayer goes up through the heaven, enveloped in light and brightness. And the gates of heaven are open for it until it reaches the presence of Allah the Most High. And it intercedes with him for the one who performed it. But if he does not complete its bowing and prostration and reciting in it, his prayer tells him, may Allah waste you as you wasted me. Then it ascends to the heaven and is enveloped in darkness, but the gates of heaven remain closed. It is then folded up as a garment is folded and thrown into the face of the one who performed it. And that was collected by Bayhaqi. Brothers and sisters, think about that. Your prayer, in a sense, is a gift. It is going to go up to heaven to meet Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It is going to intercede with you. If you wanted to present a king or a famous person or the president with a gift, you will choose a beautiful gift. You will choose something that that person will like and will love. How is it we could present to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala an ugly prayer, a thoughtless prayer, an incomplete prayer, a hastily performed prayer? So we should take care, my brothers and sisters, may Allah have mercy upon you, to make this prayer a beautiful gift, that when it meets Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, it will be truly an intercessor for us, not something that will be rolled up and thrown in our face like a dirty garment. So brothers and sisters, all of this should make us clear that it is not only praying, but praying in time and praying attentively in the proper manner that is really, really important here. So my dear brothers and sisters, please do not be lazy in taking care of this prayer. If your prayer is good, your life will be good. Really, believe me, if your prayer is sound and your prayer is good, your life will be sound and your life will be good. It is the key to your successful life. It is the key to your life as a Muslim is a salah. It's the key. So take care of this key and use it properly and utilize it in the best way. Now the other issue I want to talk about is praying in the mosque. This is a very important issue. Is it a major sin not to pray in the mosque? 
Well, this is an issue we need to look at and we need to discover, insha'Allah. So, let us look, first of all, in the Qur'an. Let's look in Surah Al-Qalam, in the 68th Surah, which is in, in Ayah 42 to 43. So the meaning of which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, the meaning of which is, a day when the truth will be uncovered, and they will be called upon to prostrate, but they will not be able to. With their eyes cast down, disgrace will overwhelm them. And therefore, they had been called upon to prostrate while they were whole. So when they were called upon to prostrate in this life, they didn't. So on the day of judgment, they will be called to prostrate and they will not be able to do it. In one narration it mentions their backs will be made straight and every time they try to prostrate, they will tumble over. They will not be able to do it. So one of the Mufassirun, he said in explanation of this, it means that in this life they heard the Aqama, they heard the Adhan, and they heard the Aqama. That's when they were called to prostrate in this life. This means they heard, this is the hearing that they heard. Hayya ala salah, hayya ala al-falah, but they, did, they didn't answer. They just kept on laughing and playing and joking and working and buying and selling and so on and so forth. And they ignored the adhan from the masjid and they took no account of it and they just got on with their life. So this will be their condition when they meet Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala on the day of judgment. So Kaab al-Ahbar, he said, these verses were revealed concerning those who did not join the Salat al-Jama'ah, the congregational prayer. And what can be stronger and more suitable warning than this for those who left off prayer in Jama'ah while they were able to attend it? And Abu Huraira radiallahu anhu, he said that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, by him in whose hand is my soul, I considered giving orders for fuel and having it gathered, then giving orders for the prayer to be called, for the adhan to be made for the prayer, and then ordering a person to lead the prayer so I could go out and burn the houses of those people who did not attend the salah. In fact, the Prophet ﷺ said, the only thing that prevented me from doing that was the families, the children and the women inside the home. This is how angry and upset the Prophet ﷺ was, and this hadith was collected by both Bukhari and Muslim, very authentic hadith. So it shows how upset the Prophet ﷺ was by those people who heard the call to prayer, who knew that it was time for the salah in the jama'ah, and they did not come to pray in the masjid. Indeed, there was a man who was blind, and he came to the Prophet ﷺ. He said, O Messenger of Allah, as you can tell, I am blind. And the streets of Medina have dangers and hazards. You know, in the streets of Medina in those days, there were snakes, there were scorpions, there were dangerous things, there were hazards. And he said, and I have no one to lead me through the streets. There was no one to lead him. So can I pray at home? The Prophet ﷺ said, yes. But then just as the man was leaving, he told him to wait. And he said to him, can you hear the call to prayer? And the man said, yes. He said, then you have to go to the masjid to pray even if you have to crawl. Oh, my brothers, and this is for the brothers. If this is what the Prophet ﷺ said to a man who was blind, if he can hear the call to prayer, you must go to the masjid and pray even if you have to crawl through hazards, through dangers, scorpions, snakes. And we know how many allowances there are in Islam for difficulties. We talked about that already. Yet still this man needed to go and the Prophet ﷺ did not give him permission to stay at home. How about those of us who can see and who have cars and motorbikes and bicycles and so many easy means of conveyance, yet we hear the call to prayer and we ignore it. Subhanallah, what are we going to be saying and how are we going to be when we meet Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala on the day of judgment? What a serious matter, brothers and sisters. So I hope you understand from this the seriousness of not praying in the masjid. And I say the sisters, actually for the sisters, it is not obligatory upon them to pray in the masjid for the salah. If they want to, they can. And the Prophet ﷺ said, 
do not stop the female servants of Allah from praying in the masjid. However, as also the Prophet ﷺ said, that the prayer of the woman in her home is better than the prayer in the masjid, and the prayer in her small room in her home is better than the room in her home, and so on and so forth. So the Prophet ﷺ made it clear that for the women it's actually better and more rewardable for them to pray at home. However, if they want to go to the masjid or they have some need to go to the masjid, they should not be prevented. And it's one of the sad things that we find in reality is that there are some cultures and some people who do not provide a place or a space for women to pray in the masjid. And this is what used to be done in the time of the Prophet ﷺ. The women used to pray in the masjid and there was provisions made for them. So we should not neglect that aspect of the sunnah. However, mashallah, if the women should pray at home, that is good for them. And it goes back to a topic that we were discussing before, is that sometimes we find people are very, very strict about enforcing certain things. So they would say, for example, well, for the women to pray at home is better for them. And, you know, they may even go as far as saying it's makruh for them to pray in the masjid. Yet, the women do not wear hijab. All these men themselves oppress and treat their women badly. So you find them immersed in things that are acts of disobedience to Allah, yet they're trying to enforce upon people things that are recommended acts. This is not really a good understanding of how we should follow the religion of Al-Islam. So my brothers, let us take a special care to establish as-salah in the masjid, in jama'ah. This is something that is very important. The Prophet ﷺ said that if there are three of you who live in a valley, so if three of you live in a valley and you don't meet together to establish the salah in jama'ah, then a shaitan has got hold of you. So this is a very important uh, understanding that even if there are a few of us, three of us, as few as three of us, we need to establish the salah in jama'ah. That is something that we need to do because the hand of Allah is over the jama'ah because that is how we protect ourselves from shaitan. And this is the importance. You know, we mentioned before, you can understand the importance of an action by looking at its opposite. How great is a sin? Look at the opposite of it. Look at the opposite of it. So how important must be praying together in jama'ah because it is part of what establishes the jama'ah of the Muslims, the unity of the Muslims. The bringing together of our bodies is also connected with the bringing together of our hearts. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He talked about the believers, إِنَّمَا الْمُؤْمِنُونَ إِخْوَةً Verily the believers, certainly the believers are brothers. So this brotherhood in Islam is very important. Brothers, they support each other, they help each other, they aid each other, they protect each other from evil and from wrongdoing and from disobedience to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So if we don't meet together and we don't pray together, and that is part of the purpose of praying together, that is part of the purpose of us having masjids and praying together in jama'ah, is that it establishes the brotherhood, the unity amongst us, and it gives us a means and an avenue in order to help us to obey Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and to keep far away from disobeying Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So my dear brothers and sisters, we need to really take care. And the sisters, I encourage you, please, to encourage your husbands to leave the homes at the time of our salah and to go and pray in the masjid. And don't be shy about encouraging them to do acts of goodness and to do acts of obedience. And what is better than a pious woman? The Prophet ﷺ, he said, the whole world is green and verdant. The whole world is beautiful. You know, it's there for you to enjoy, mashallah, as long as it's halal. Enjoy it. But the best thing in this dunya, from all the dunya, the best thing is a pious woman. Subhanallah. The best thing is a pious woman. So brothers, you will not be blessed by anything from this dunya better for you than a pious woman. And a pious woman will not be happy to see her husband sitting at home, 
while the salah is taking place in jama'ah. She will encourage him and persuade him with all her charms in the nicest way, in the best way to go and pray in jama'ah, in salah. And also, you should take your sons and you should go with your children, especially once they have reached the age of seven and definitely once they have reached the age of ten, they should also be going to pray in the masjid, in uh, the jama'ah, in salah. So this is one of the very important aspects of our deen is the masjid and establishing the masjid and praying together in congregation in the masjid. And I just want to uh, conclude with a very nice little story from someone called Hatim Asim. He said, once I missed a congregational prayer, but only Abu Ishaq Bukhari offered me condolences for such a tragedy. Whereas if a child of mine had died, more than 10,000 people would have offered me condolences. Indeed, a misfortune in religion is less in the eyes of people than worldly misfortunes. And look at this beautiful understanding of this beautiful man, this beautiful scholar, how he was so upset and how he was so uh, distressed by missing a prayer in congregation. Yet if his child had died, so many people would have offered him condolences, but only one person offered him condolences when he missed his prayer in Jama'at. And that's how it is, the reality with most people. For most of us, we think of a worldly loss as being a terrible loss, but we don't really understand that being a loser in the deen is the true loss. So my dear brothers and sisters, establish a salah, establish the prayer in Jama'at, insha'Allah, and you will find the forgiveness of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and His mercy come into your life. Repent to Allah, it is never, it doesn't matter what you have done. If you have not prayed until today, start praying today. Repent to Allah, change your way, change your behavior, establish the prayer. Repent to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and you will find that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the most forgiving, He is the most merciful. So until next time, my dear brothers and sisters, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.